never let them mold you. It's your piece of clay. It's your canvas. So mold or paint the picture the way you see it, not how others see it. The world's full of sheep, and the last thing it needs is another sheep. So change your direction, change your surroundings, make yourself uncomfortable because comfort causes the spirit to die. Your heart is always long for passion. The minute you quit feeding it what it needs to pump is the minute that you sleepwalk to your own grave. These are the songs that have been waiting on me. They've been waiting on me to, to finally write them. And this is the record I've been waiting to make. The one that leaves you with a, with a peace in your heart because you know that you did it exactly the way you wanted to. It's the record that makes it okay if you, if you fail because it truly came from your soul and no other place. people that have inspired this record, the towns, and the people that don't even know they inspired this record. There she is. Do I miss you? I can't say I don't. I put me on trial, but I won't tell. If I want you and I always will. Uh -huh. Taking four months and traveling all over the place and, and having that time to soak in the thoughts from the previous year and internalizing all that, that that's what created Slow Heart. <laughs> Tifton and my family is what shaped me. So I, I just, I felt like going home was the only way to wrap things up. Tifton's changed a ton. Like when I was, when I was a kid, none of this was here. I mean, every bit of this that you see, this was all just vacant. I mean, this was all woods or whatever. We had this raceway and that gas station, but we didn't have a Longhorn. We didn't have a Wendy's right here. Like, all this is new. The whole town is, has uh, changed. This was, heck, this was Ad Adcock Pecans. I don't even think that's Adcock Pecans anymore. That was, a, that was the big deal. We were known for, yeah, it still is. It still is. I mean, we, that's, that's kind of our, that's what we're known for right there, Adcock Pecans. Every Friday night, my dad would take us when we were little kids, would take us, and that was a big deal. That's, to me, that's, that's the main thing that people are missing now with their kids, with like how everything's at a click of a button. That was an event. When we got to go to that video store, we all walked around together, me, my brothers, and my dad, and it was all about looking on the box, looking on the back of the cover, so this is the house that I grew up in, up until I was probably, I don't know, 11, 10 or 11, I would say. Yeah, I've been getting trashed. Yeah. I saw some video of Lee Bryce playing like 
and it's like whole family was around at Christmas. And everybody was kind of in the circle, just playing all these songs, and everybody was kind of like, you know, clapping, singing along. Like that would not fly in my household. <laughs> We'd have been like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> we, we joked to your face, but like to each other. Exactly. Like I would call Brother David or Brian and be like, man, this is really good. Have you heard this song? But then you, I'd be like, man, this is trash. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it wouldn't be. It was we had to do it to each other's face, but behind their back. And you know, yeah. it was just different. Oh, some of that magic, magic. My father passed several years ago. Uh, my mom is still around, and she's you know one of the most amazing human beings that I've e I've ever encountered. Way you love, me close. Her love for music was so evident. She always wanted to play piano for Willie Nelson. She was always playing Redheaded Stranger. And so much of that shaped me was her musical influence. And then my dad was the, it's crazy about the Motown era and Bob Seger and Springsteen. I didn't know he could play guitar. He, he never, never showed any signs with music. I taught music. None of the kids acted like they were that crazy about learning to play the piano or anything. But the first time I ever heard him even attempt to play, he sat out here and he just started um, playing this guitar. And so he's sitting about right here and he's banging his foot and he's trying to play this guitar. And I'm standing in the kitchen listening to him and I, I automatically did like the sound of his voice. It had that kind of raspy sound, but he didn't really know when to change the chord or anything, you know, and I'm, I'm saying, Kip, change the chord, <laughs> you know, but he was so persistent in learning how to play. Well, I woke to the rats, sun going down, still taste of whiskey, fresh on my mouth. The label really didn't even know I was making the record at first. Um, I was kind of just making it quietly. Every time I got off the road, I was writing this record. This record came out exactly like I had it in my head. I don't think I've had the feeling that I have now on any other record where I feel like I'm sitting on something so special. When I think about the people that were involved in this journey in making Slow Heart, they're dreamers. I got to be surrounded by people that are moved by the small things. We're always talking about dreams because that's what keeps us alive. That's what keeps our, our blood pumping. I, I know how lucky I am to get to wake up and do what I love every day. But at the same time, I think about those sacrificing from 22 to 30 years old and not making a dime. And as poor as I was, as broke as I was, there was the excitement of anything could happen, like lightning could strike at any moment. I learned through Wild Ones that my audience is gonna be there with me no matter what. I've always believed if I show that I believe in the music, then my hope is that they're gonna believe in it. Our fan base tripled off of Wild Ones, so I knew that just going in and make the record that I wanted to make, these fans that have grown up with us, they're gonna be there with us. Melodies are the strongest I've been a part of. Um, I felt like I dug deeper to search for the right melody and the right lyric for every song on this record. I feel like this record is, is, is special because it evokes so many emotions for me. In, in interviews, sometimes I'll get asked, you know, who's my, who's my hero? It's my sister, it's Jennifer. 
Jennifer was in a, a, a car accident when she was in her when she was in her teens and got paralyzed from the waist down, and uh, it was such a blow to my family. I can remember Jennifer being in a, a very dark place, and understandably so, for for quite some time. But it was like one day she just woke up and accepted that that was her circumstance, and is possibly the most positive, fun-loving, strong-willed human beings I've ever met. Baby, I'll try, try, try. No, I won't quit. Even before I was, uh, I was injured, he was very protective of me. I feel like he's always pretty much looked out for me and tried to, I mean, as busy as he's been, he still calls and checks up on me and makes sure that, you know, everything's going good and if I need anything. If I were to need anything, he would, he would come through, for sure. I'm gonna get so sad. <laughs> okay, okay, all right, won't be long. I don't remember Kip coming back between Hawaii and Nashville. I think he just packed his bags from there and went to Nashville. <laughs> When Kip left, he left, and he went, and he, you know, stayed in contact with us and that, that sort of thing, but he really was um, just shifted around, found people to live with. It didn't require much. He didn't require any clothes. You know, he could just live in the same, he could live in the same outfit and not bathe, you know, whatever he needed to do. I, like, I enjoy coming home. I enjoy coming home and having the slow pace, and I'm proud of where I came from. Uh, but I, I can, it's just an honest statement. I always, I always felt like the, min the, the minority amongst my friends where I always wanted to get out and see the world. When you're in a place that, that makes you kind of feel that solitude, that's what spawns thought for me. sit in a place like this, I start being reflective on where I've been in my life in, this, in these moments. So Costa Rica has been responsible for a lot of the feeling of this record. Give me a little something. <laughs> <laughs> he, he can get down. He's the man here. <laughs> I think about how I met all these people that have become so influential in my music and my life, and I think about a guy like Pete, who I met in the process of making the Wild Ones record. I was staying in a place called Tamarindo, and I, and I paddled across the river to a place called Playa Grande, and Pete was the only one in the water. And I see this guy walking down the beach from like four miles away with his surfboard. <laughs> Like, God is my witness. He paddles out right here, right next to me. I just started talking. Leave it, buddy. Leave it, man. 
Hey there, man, what you doing? What you doing, Bubba? Huh? What you doing? What's your favorite thing about having Kip down in Costa Rica with you? He comes here to fit into Costa Rica. He doesn't force Costa Rica to fit into him. about Kip is that he is in his head a lot. He's a very intense person and I've been accused of being too intense. I sometimes get in my head and I think about all the things that I want to do, all the things I want to accomplish. The failure in that is that when you're thinking about all the things you want to accomplish, you're missing the moment. And I heard you talk about it when you talk about people in your crowd with your pho the phones, right? They're, you're up there performing, and they're there. They've waited for six months to see you live, and they're doing this. They got this phone between you and them, and they're watching you through the phone. They're doing that because they're thinking about when I'm not here, I can look back at that memory, right? Which yeah. is a really valid thing, and we, we all kind of do that. But what they're missing is that second right now. And I'm always inspired by Pete, because if, if anybody should be down, it should be Pete. But I've, I've never met somebody that's more excited about tomorrow. You know, the weird thing about my disease and telling, sharing with people that I'm sick, um, because my cancer isn't curable, I still have it. When you tell people that you have cancer, you get one of two reactions. One reaction is, um, Oh my God, are you okay? The other reaction is kind of like a, just a deadpan stare. When you get the deadpan stare, that means that person has been affected by cancer some way. And I got that stare from Kip, but I didn't realize what it was. And it wasn't until we were in Philly that he had told me that his dad died of cancer. Ooh wee! Let me get a hamburger. Some fries. Yeah! yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> this is my girl. Yes, you been you? all right? Doing good. How you been doing? I'm good. I've been good. Oh, I, my sister and I was talking about you yesterday. I was like, I wish Kip would come home. Quita just left. Quita just Quita was still here? Yes. Oh, man, I would have loved seeing Quita. It's hard for me to even come back to this place. I was talking about my brothers. It's just changed. The feeling has changed so much kind of out here. My dad was such a, he was such a figure and such a character, and he'd been out here for so long. I just have so many amazing memories of working out here and always seeing him ride around on the tractor and spray and everything and so this is the other house that we lived in my whole family this is like two bedrooms so me and my two brothers and i know joanna was born i think jennifer was too so i think there was five kids we we yet to have six but this was our other house right here 
So this is the path that me and my brother David would go hide in when we would just be like tired of working. You could see who's coming from this way and you could see who's coming from behind you. You could hear a cart. So if we heard a cart, we could exit. We knew which way the cart was coming from. Brian and I got closer later on in life. Brian was so much older than I was and him and David were kind of close, but I was really close with David. Brian was kind of the artsy brother, you know? So I got that side from him. David and I were really competitive in sports and he was a great athlete, all American golfer. And we were just so, we were thick as thieves growing up. I mean, we were always together. And on the golf course, we were always together working. I was the weed eater. That was me and my brother right there. As hard as the work was, I mean, y'all feel how hot this heat is and how bad these gnats are. And we were always laying sod and edging bunkers and doing all the manual labor, but these were some of the best times of my life. My dad was so great in, in so many ways. Yes. He was tough, he was, he was tough. tough. But like I said, he, I mean, he just, there was never any of that. No. I'm gonna wait until you get home. We're gonna talk about this kind no. of thing. It was just, uh, it was at the moment. Boom, I call you out in front of a million people. And <laughs> So he was going up the staircase because he was making fun of his golf game or telling him something he was doing wrong in golf. And so Kip went up the staircase and I saw him put his fist through this sheetrock. So then I had to figure out a way to keep him from getting in real trouble. Well, this is the picture of the little cute girl rocking, you know, the sweet little baby. Well, there it is. There's his bump and I've got some mudding over it, but I'm never... <laughs> I don't did, know did, how to did he ever find out? That. Did he ever find out? No, he never <laughs> found out. I miss my dad so, so bad. We, me and my brothers always call each other and talk about how much we miss him. He was so intense where I get my intensity from, but he was so kind and sweethearted too. He was, he was funny though, man, he was funny. I can remember my dad, we got in an argument when he came to see me early on in my career before I had any hits and he saw me open for Rodney Atkins and he came to the bar in Jacksonville. And at my set was 50 minutes and I played only my songs. So when we got done, he was like, man, you gotta play you know, Hank and you gotta play Tim McGraw and you gotta play all these people. And I said, well, Pop, if I do that, I'm just another guy singing cover tunes in a bar. I said, but if I went over a hundred people out of those seven, eight hundred people in there, if I really win them over, then I'm, I'm building an army that way. We never dreamed it would just keep mushrooming and going because Kip just went at it slowly and it was a slow, steady kind of build. And I let that note right there kind of linger you know, kind of cut it yeah. off. Yeah. I want this to sound just, just build into rowdiness kind of thing. You know what I mean? While I'm kind of singing, you can kind of make those like the, this part and kind of a little bit muted on that part. Sure. And it kind of open up once yeah, the chorus Yeah, but just stay on that lick the whole time. The whole way through. I feel like everything has been preparation for this record. All the years of studying the great writers and writing out all the lyrics and trying to understand the metaphors they use and the playoff of words. It's 103. They, I kind of heard that they were like, man, this feels like, you know, 70s rock and roll. And I was like, exactly. I just felt the need to produce this myself. Um, 
You know, I, I did a I did a couple of co-producing tracks with guys like Luke Dick and David Garcia, but for the most part, um, I just I did most of this record by myself. Dave, freaking love, love the part. Let's let's make it a little more of a thing when this chorus comes around. Like I like the sparseness of the single notes, but every now and then come back to that. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Dun, dun, dun. That kind of thing, you know. I think that I just I lived with these songs for so long. I would let all these songs just soaking in my blood. Like, let's let the other guitar be the guy in this course and you just stay on that chunk. You know, we're not giving up too much of the cards yet. Yeah. Exactly, just stay on that guy the whole way through that first course. It's like I like the chime on that. <laughs> And I just knew I had to go in and do it myself. Um, I didn't want to have that that battle of and that rub that can sometimes happen in the studio of we need to go this way. It was, no, damn it. I know exactly what I want. I know how I want it to sound. I know what I want this record to be. Bam. Try to steer clear of the bull. There's a lot of bull. Uh, there's a lot of things being pushed on you, not only in music, but just in life in general. You know, society pushes these things on you from the time that you're born. Of this is how you should feel. This is how she should act. This is the steps she should take. I'm always trying to run away from that. I want to shed myself of the norm. I want to experience as many new things as I can every day, if possible. That's why I take these trips. I want to immerse myself in different environments and different cultures, different ways of living, different views on things. That's what keeps my spirit alive. I've never experienced anything like what Iceland had to offer. It was the, it was the single most powerful place I've ever, I've ever encountered. You, you had this feeling the whole time. It was deafening quiet, and it could be so beautiful and peaceful, but in the same moment, you knew that it had the capabilities to crush you at any moment. I met Jeremy when I first moved to town, pretty much. And man, me and that guy, we, we've been like brothers ever since. Go ahead. Is there a new Pirates of the Caribbean coming out? That I'm serious. He's been contemplating that for the last two hours, is there Pirates of the Caribbean coming up? <laughs> uh, Jeremy saw you, everybody. Jeremy shares the same adventure heart that I do. He's been super instrumental in the process of this record because he's always been instrumental. Jeremy was the guy that I would call years ago and I would play him every song that I'd written and he would always dissect every detail of the song and what he liked and what he didn't like. And, and Jeremy is that guy that 
is passionate about everything. Well, I come from Georgia, not a nice and Florida. Left her when I turned 18. Mama asked, son, when you coming back? But there's still a lot of guys. Iceland shaped a lot of the songs that came about. I took away a lot of ideas from that solitude and that quiet, and I came back, and it was very influential in the writing process of Slow Heart. Well, I've been a lot of places, kissed a lot of faces, every city, every town. Kind of like the wind, ask me where I've been, I'll tell you that I've been around. Yeah, I'll tell you that I've been around. journey it took to get to the place of recording these songs and writing these songs. It was all a gradual, organic process. Uh, I think about the, the power of places like Iceland and Costa Rica, these places that have had such an impact on the way I see the world, the way I see myself, the way I feel about music. He has a real spiritual side to him that I love. He's very giving. He loves people. He's never seen color. I know I'm his mom, but the truth of the matter is he's just a genuine, real person. If you are my last breath, I just want to hold you. If you are my last night of hell on wheels, I want to drive you like a stole you. If you are my last shot, last shot of whiskey, I press you to my lips. My goals are different now. I'm not, I'm, I'm not basing my success off accolades and am I doing arenas and I'm doing it the way I want to do it. I get to wake up every day and do what I love and that is success to me. Well, I just wanna hold you. Time to fire up that two-tone bucket of rust Throw my amp in my case in the back of my truck Breathe in my freedom with the windows rolled down Forty-six miles till the next nameless town Light out 